let's estimate a logistic regression model. So we have data from an experiment in this problem. The experiment was as follows. We, um, I guess we, we have some sort of a soft drink company and we have bottles. Now we're considering placing a deposit on these bottles to get consumers to return them. Now the question is, how does the size of the deposit that we place on the bottle relate to whether or not the bottle gets returned? So notice my dependent variable here is whether or not the bottle gets returned, and that's dichotomous. So um, I've got a numerical independent variable, which is the or causal variable, which is the deposit size and a cat, you know, dichotomous outcome. We run an experiment, so we have different price or you know deposit levels: two cents, five cents, ten, twenty, twenty-five, and thirty cents per bottle. For each of those um, deposit amounts we sell 500 bottles. Okay, so we sell 500 bottles, we observe the number that are returned. So when I charge two cents, 72 out of the 500 bottles get returned. Now we can form a very simple estimate of the probability that it's returned. If we take 72 divided by 500, it looks like there's about a 14% chance that the bottle comes back. And that's what this black circle shows. That's 14%. If I charge five cents, so here's five cents, 103 come back. We can almost do that one in our head. 103 divided by 500 is going to be about 20%, a little bit more than 20%. So that's that next circle. All right, if we charge, what would this be, 20 cents, we get almost 300 back about 60% come back. And so that's that circle. Clearly that's at about 0.6. All right, so these circles trace the path of you know the percentage returned, probability that we get a bottle back, as a function of the deposit that we're charging. So the problem that we're asked to do, okay, plot the estimated proportions against x. We just did that x being the deposit amount, estimate a logistic regression model, and superimpose the fitted values. Well, I've done all the R for you down here. Um, I, have, I have to make a, uh, another version of the data set. That's what this does. And what, if we go look at that data set, bot2 then has, um, it's, it's uh, just slightly different format. So consider a two cent deposit. Okay, clearly, um, all right, th this is what was given to us. There were 72 bottles uh, that were returned at two cents. So that's what that row does. If there were 72 bottles that were returned, that what that means is there were 428 bottles, so 500 minus 72 that never came back. So that's what that observation is. At five cents, there were 103 that came back, or 397 that didn't come back. So that's what the data set looks like. Now to fit a logistic regression in R, you're going to use the GLM function. Now GLM stands for Generalized Linear Model. It's a lot like LM for linear model, um, but it's generalized in, in, in two main ways. We're going to talk more about this. There'll be another video on generalized linear models. The two generalizations are we're going to have um, a different set of, of you know, air distributions. So errors don't have to be normal. Um, in this case, we're going to make those errors binomial. So this family equals binomial means my errors follow the binomial distribution. The second generalization is that we're going to allow um, you know, some sort of a link function that transforms the mean of y, so the probability of, of a return, um, so that we don't have to go out of bounds. So we're going to use the logit function by default. Now, I've got weighted data. Each um, observation in this data set you know, really 
isn't an observation, it stands for a bunch of observations. So this first row really should count 428 times. This row should only count 72 times. So if I wait by count, I get the right answer. All right, I get a fitted value. And if we do a summary on fit, so here's our summary on fit, I get some output that looks a lot like what you're used to with linear regression. So what we get is a row for each parameter in the model. I have an intercept. I also have a slope for, for x. And then I have the usual estimates with their standard errors. I have a z value and a p value. So let's start by estimating the, S, you know, the, the regression equation. So the log odds will be my dependent variable. Pi is the probability that a bottle gets returned. Here are my log odds. Uh, the slope comes from here. So minus 2.08. Now that negative value means uh, we're starting out, so with the deposit of zero, um, there's a very small probability that these, uh, these uh, bottles get returned. So remember, negative log odds correspond to probabilities that are, that are less than, hold on, big negative values like this correspond to probabilities that are close to zero. However, uh, we have a slope. Okay, so for every additional um, cent that we charge, the log odds that the bottle comes back goes up by 0.136. Now, I've superimposed this uh, regression equation up here. So I, I took a lot of, um, of values from 2 to 30. I gave myself 100 values in the middle. Um, I use predict to get the predicted values. More on that in a minute. And superimpose this as the red line. So the point I want to make is that this red line roughly passes through these black circles. So you know, we're getting pretty good predictions of whether of, of the probability of a, of a return. You know, and if we look at the residuals, you know, some are going to be positive, some are going to be negative. So this gives us a pretty good fit. And the 20 cent one's a little bit off, but we're not quite sure what's going on there. All right. Um, actually, let's go back to this. Now, just as with linear regression, we're very interested in whether this slope could possibly be zero. Now let's think about the implications of a zero slope. What that means is, for every additional cent that I charge in the deposit, the log odds that the bottle comes back don't change. So if that's zero, that means that deposit has no effect on, my, uh, on, the, on the chance that it comes back. So let's go take some notes. If we did H naught, beta 1 equal to 0, what that means is deposit has no effect on returns, the probability that it comes back. Against the alternative, beta 1 not equal to 0, that's, uh, that's a hypothesis of great interest to us. So if I look down here, uh, the I have three stars. The p-value is uh, tiny, so ten to the two times ten to the minus sixteenth. So p is equal to two times ten to the minus sixteenth power. So that's point fifteen zeros and then a two. That's way, way, way less than 0 0.05. So we reject h naught. Conclude that the um, amount we charge for the deposit has an effect on the probability of return. At least there's an association there. All right. We could also test this using the confidence interval approach. So we get the confidence interval in the exact same way we did with linear models, confint of our fitted value. 
the 95% confidence interval for the slope is provided for, for us here. Now we could write this as follows. Zero is not in the interval, so 0.1266 comma 0.1453. So we reject the uh, reject the value zero as a slope, and thus we reject H naught. Conclude the same thing. Um, so the more we charge the more likely it is that the bottle comes back. A couple other things. What is the probability that a bottle will be returned if we charge 15 cents? All right, so remember in the previous video I called the linear predictor an eta? So let's, let's define an eta. Um, Fit coefficient 1, so coefficient 1 is going to be minus 2.08, and then coefficient 2 will be this, 0.136. So all I'm doing is I'm evaluating this equation. This gives me my eta. So my eta in this case, if I take this times 15, 15 being the amount of the deposit, gives me a value that's close to 0, slightly, slightly negative. Now remember, log odds of zero corresponds to a probability of 0.5. So our hunch is uh, the probability is going to be a little bit less than 0.5. All right, now, if we do just to predict, this is what you would expect to do based on what we have been doing with linear models. What you get is the linear predictor, so minus you know, 0.388. All right, but that's not what we want. We want the probability. So to get the probability, we have to unload it, this minus 0 0.308. So how do we unload it something? we got to use the squashing function. So we need to invert that thing. So this is just going to be 1 pl plus e to the negative eta, and then take the reciprocal of that. So I did that. So here's the hard way. 1 over 1 plus e to the negative eta. If you're not convinced of that, we could go type that in. So 1 over 1 plus exp to the negative negative 0 0.0388. You get about 0.49. Now that's what I got here, 0.49. And that went with my intuition. Now how do you get... So I, I think it's very worthwhile to do a couple problems like this, just so that you really understand that formula. There are situations where you're not going to have R, and then you're going to have to use that. Um, but when you're in R, you can get uh, R to unload it for you by saying type equals response. Okay, so that's what you're going to use in real life. Another problem that you may have is something like this. Uh, suppose I want three quarters or 75% of the bottles to be returned. What sort of deposit should I charge? Okay, so in essence, this 0.75 is giving us our pi. So we want the log of pi over 1 minus pi to be equal to this for some x. So what is the x? Well, let's see. If I take 0.75 divide by 0.75, 2, 5. So 1 minus 0.75 is 0.25. Notice 0.75 over 0.25 is 3. So this is really the log of 3. So I just have to solve this equation. Got to do a little bit of math. Uh, I need to charge about 23 or 24 cents in order to get 75% of my bottles back. All right, that's it for the um, uh, bottle return problem.